Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on plant simulation. In this video, we will see how we can make our simulations more modular by creating our own objects and thus save development time and be more flexible to changes. To exemplify it, we are going to simulate the following process, very common in mass production companies of small components. We have a conveyor system that we feed with five different types of parts. Each of these parts has to be processed by an operator on an independent branch of the main conveyor. The processed parts then return to the main conveyor and exit where they entered. Just as we did in previous videos, we are going to start with the class objects that we will already need in a special folder for our exercise, and some of them already instantiated on the frame. If you have questions about how we got here, I recommend that you watch the previous seven videos in order, where we explain it in more detail. Before continuing, let's finish configuring the objects that we already have instantiated in the model. For the source, we are going to configure that parts arrive following a normal distribution with a mean of 30 seconds, a sigma of 20 seconds, and bounded between 0 seconds and a minute. Additionally, we are going to define it to produce parts randomly based on the data table. In it, we are going to put a different class for each of the types of parts that we want to produce, which we have previously configured so that they have different icons that we can differentiate by color. Let's define all five of them the same frequency and have them appear in batches of one part. Finally, we will configure the creation table of the worker pool to produce based on our own class and to create three workers at the beginning of the simulation. Of course, all the conveyors and footpaths are connected to each other, so if we now start the model, we should see how the parts enter, make a complete turn, and then leave. We would then only have to create the four independent branches to be able to process each part. We could do this directly on the frame, but since they are all exactly the same, wouldn't it be much more efficient to define them only once and instantiate them as many times as we needed, as if it were just another toolbox object? Well, that is precisely what we are going to do today. To begin, we are going to create a subfolder within our exercise that we will call Branch. Then we right-click on it, select New Black Box Frame, and we will rename it Branch as well. The only difference between this type of frame and the model frame is that the former one does not include an event controller, but in our case that is not a problem, as we will see later. On this frame we are going to model a single branch. To do this, we are going to create all the classes we need within the branch folder, and we are going to instantiate them within this frame. Once again, the modeling of these elements has already been seen in previous videos, so I am not going to explain how to do these steps. This frame that we have called branch is our new object. Now we can drag it to the exercise toolbar and instantiate it on our model. If we go inside, we will see that there are instances of the objects that we have defined in the class library. We can visualize this better if we show the inheritance of the station object and see what the dependencies are like. However, there are still several steps left before we can use this object within the main frame. To start, we need parts to be able to move in and out of our branch object. To do this, we are going to use a new object, the interface, that we will find in the Material Flow folder. Let's create our own copy in the Object folder. Here, I'd like to make a clarification. When we work with our own objects, it is very easy to get confused between the parent object and an instance, since both are frames. Therefore, we have to be very careful and know exactly where we are making each modification. In our case, we will not need to touch the instance at all, so all the changes we make will always be in the parent. That being said, let's see how the interface object is used. This object is used to move MUs from one frame to another, which is precisely what we needed. We are going to need three interfaces, one for the entry of parts, one for the exit, and one for the operator. So we instantiate them, rename them, and connect them. If we open the interface object, we see that its configuration is quite simple. Basically, it allows us to define the maximum possible number of connections, minus one being unlimited connections, and in what position of the frame they will appear from outside. Perhaps the latter is more complicated to visualize, so let's see it with an example. 
We are going to configure that the two part input and output interfaces are at the top and centered at 50%. The operator interface that is at the bottom will be also centered at 50%. Now we return to our mainframe and connect both the main conveyor to our object and the footpath. As we see, thanks to the configuration we have made in the interfaces, the connectors for the parts appear centered at the top, and that of the operators centered at the bottom. We now instantiate four more copies of the object, repeat the connections and rename them to identify to which part is each branch allocated. We are also going to configure that only the corresponding part enters each branch. To do this, we will modify the exit strategy of the conveyors preceding each branch in the following way. We are going to open the first one, go to the Exit tab, and as strategy we select MU Attribute. We click Apply and select the String Type in Attribute Type. We apply changes again, and now in the table we are going to define that when the name attribute is A, move the pieces to the successor 2. Since the connections to the branch are the last ones we have made, this successor 2 is the one for the branch. For the remaining parts that do not appear in this list, the conveyor will move them to the default successor, that is, successor 1, so they will go on without entering the branch. We will repeat this configuration with the rest of the branches, changing in each case the type of part that we send to successor 2. Once we have this, we already have our 100% functional model. If we now start the simulation, we will see how the parts only enter the corresponding station according to the type of part, and that the operators move from one branch to the next. If we enter one of the objects, we will see how in each one there is only one specific type of part. However, from the frame we are not seeing what happens within each branch, which causes us to lose visual information. Let's remedy this by editing our object's icons. The first thing we will do is open the frame of the parent branch object. To make the icon look better, we are going to go to the View tab of the toolbar and deactivate the display of the names, connections, and the grid. Now we will take a screenshot as tight as possible to the elements of the frame without including any of the interfaces. If you work with Windows, you can take a quick screenshot using the Windows plus Shift plus S keys. Once we have the screenshot, we go to editing the frame icons, then we paste the screenshot and save the changes. Now let's animate the parts above this icon. To do this, we go to the Animation tab and zoom out until we see the icon completely. The first thing we have to do is draw the path along which the parts will circulate. So we select Line and draw a line in the center of the first conveyor. When we have it, we right-click to finish. We repeat this step with the second conveyor, always following the direction of the parts. Now we select the Point tool and we are going to draw a point in the center of the station and a point in the center of the workplace. Finally, we are going to associate each of these elements with their corresponding objects. We select the Link option and click on the first line. When doing so, Plan Simulation opens our frames so that we can select which object we want to associate the line with, so we select the same conveyor. Now we repeat the same step with the rest of the elements, save the changes and exit. If everything went well, the main frame should look more realistic. We are going to finish by centering each of the branches so that they fit better in our model. Having defined the animation in the icons, if we now start the simulation, we will be able to see where each part is with the same detail as if we opened any branch. But at this point, some of you may be wondering why go to all that trouble when we could have modeled the branches directly on the main frame. Well, the first thing to note is that this is a simplified example. But imagine that instead of four branches, you have to model 10 or 50. In those cases, it would save us a lot of design time. However, the main advantage of working with your own objects is the flexibility it provides us against any change. For example, we are going to make each type of part have a different processing time. 
If we did not use our own objects, we would have to go station by station defining these times. But now we can simply create a new table in our object to define the times based on a list and include all the times we want. We then assign this table to the process time field in the station. This list should have the process time defined for each of our part types. Since this is inherited in all branches, each branch will apply only the process time of the parts that enter it. If these times changed, we would only have to modify this table once. The same thing would happen if we wanted to define failure profiles, change the speeds of the conveyors, define setups, etc. With this, we have already seen how to make our models more flexible by creating our own objects and the advantages that this type of modular design offers. In the next video, we will see how to get more out of our simulations using graphs, reports, and results in real time. Greetings, and until the next video.